Contentment blurring into end Nursing hopes for distant satisfaction In a place just around the bend Quiet revelation 
God himself has longings To connect his heart with mine and give me a home To wipe my tears and all my fears undo And the peace that's been eluding me is found by knowing you Knowing I can trust you with my life So I'll run into your loving arms Where you can make me whole And I'll rest in you, the center of my soul Well, good morning, family, people of God, friends of Arvin. Would you rise to your feet? Let's prepare our hearts and sing with full voice to the God who makes a way. You are here. Moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are here. Moving in our midst, we worship you, we worship you, you are here, working in this place, we worship you, we say, we worship you, let's tell him, you're the way maker, miracle worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You're here, we're touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every I worship you, I worship you, tell him you're turning, you are here, turning lives around, we worship you, yes we do, we worship you, you are here, bending every heart, we worship you. Light in the darkness, my God, that is 
come before you, we know that you make a way. You and you alone are worthy of all honor and glory and praise. So let's sing these words, even when I don't see it. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Yeah, you never stop, you never stop. You sound great, church. When we don't see it, you're working. Even when we don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. Lift you him never up. Stop working. You never stop. Even when you we never stop working. Even when we don't see it, you're working. Even when we don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when we don't see it, you're working. Even when we don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop. You never stop. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness of my God. That is who you are. Your love, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness of my God, that is who you are. See it again. Light, we make a miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness of my God, that is who you are. You are, you are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness of my God. That is who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. I think we need to sing that chorus again. Let every voice be raised up to the God who deserves our praise. You're the waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. We make miracle work, promise keep right in the darkness of my God. That is who you are. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close I no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God 
Good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas. My name is Morgan, and it's my privilege to welcome you this morning. So whether you're here in person or joining us online, I want to say welcome. Uh, if you are a guest with us, I want to say a special welcome to you. And I want to let you know you kind of picked an interesting morning to be our guest. All right. Um, we are today going to celebrate the retirement of a beloved pastor, Arvin. Um, and there will be plenty more about that later. Um, but Arvin, I want you to know that I practice in front of the mirror saying celebrate many times this morning so that I wouldn't accidentally say lament. <laughs> and, and even worse, so that I wouldn't accidentally say venerate, which rhymes with celebrate. We don't venerate saints here in the Protestant tradition, but if we did, you'd be on the short list, I think, for that, <laughs> Arvin. Hey, we'd love to know you're here, and so um, you can let us know you're here by filling out the Connect card that's in your bulletin. There's another one online. If you have prayer requests, if you have feedback, we'd love to hear from you. A couple things going on in the life of our church this season. Um, it's almost Christmas. Do you guys know that? So if you haven't gotten your gifts yet, it's time to start thinking about cash and gift cards, I think, at this point. But in two weeks, on Christmas Eve morning, we're not going to meet here at our normal morning time. We're going to meet instead in the afternoon. So plan on joining us either at 4 p.m. or 6 p.m. Those will be two identical services. We will have a combination of traditional and contemporary elements. We'll have candles and glow sticks, backed by popular demand, of course. And we'll have a joyous, simple celebration of the birth of Jesus. So join us then. Another thing that's a tradition in this church around Advent season is we give offerings above and beyond our normal offerings to our global and our local partners. All right. And the last several Sundays, we've been sharing with you personal stories from some of our ministry partners. We want to do that again today, and we're going to watch a video here in a minute. But I want to let you know that this ministry that we're highlighting uh, this morning is Sunrise Ministries in Uganda. It is, yeah, you can cheer if you want. That's great. <laughs> It is a phenomenal ministry. They do so many things. You have heard people up here on, in front talking about some of those things. We're going to highlight a story today of a baby named Gabby. Gabby is a young child who was abandoned in a, a, a sugarcane plantation, all right, basically left to die. She was found in the nick of time. She was malnourished, but she was still alive. And she eventually found a home in the baby village of Sunrise Ministries. And this is a, a village where she's now thriving among 67 other children under the age of three who have been brought here. There's a woman in the video, too, you're going to meet named Damali. And Damali started this part of Sunrise's ministry about 14 years ago. She was a, a single 20-something-year-old social worker who was just tired of seeing abandoned children in her community. She decided to do something about it, and uh, she took an abandoned baby into her apartment, and it's grown since then. So with that, let's roll the video. Hello. 
Hello, this is Damari from Sunrise Baby Home. Today, I just want to share with you the story of Gabby. Gabby was abandoned at a sugarcane plantation. A lady uh, who was passing by discovered Gabby by the bush and she took Gabby to the police. The police took Gabby to the hospital because Gabby was very, very severely malnourished and she needed urgent care and urgent help. Gabby is now uh, at Mirembe Cottage. We transferred her to, to Mirembe Cottage um, because there was no surviving relative who was able to take care of her. But we thank God because Gabby is alive and well. She's now thriving and for that we thank God. All right, so that's just one part of Sunrise's ministry. Um, if you want to give to outreach this Advent season, then um, I encourage you to write that on your check. Just write outreach. You can do the same thing online. And with that, I also want to thank those of you that call Saratoga Federated Church home for your continued gifts to support our ministries. Um, there's many ways to do that. You can use the white boxes in the back. You can use the QR code on the back of your bulletin. Would you now join me in prayer for our offering? Father God, we give you thanks this morning. Thank you for your many gifts. Thank you that we can be a part of your ministry, not only within these walls, but also in our community and around the world. We pray for people that need to hear you and um, that we can help support. So would you bless us this holiday season as we bless others? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. With that, why don't you stand up, turn around to someone around you, and say good morning. It is a lovely thing to see one another. I'm sure some folks haven't seen each other in a bit. Let's make our way back to our seats. We're going to continue in the Advent season with a reading. And if you've joined us online, we're so glad you're here. Continue worshiping with us throughout the course of this service. Thanks for honoring us with your presence this morning. Sunday of Advent, we re reflect the greatest love story ever told. The stories of God's immense, immense a lot us as the promise uh, demonstrates to the birth on His Son Jesus Christ. Today we light the Advent candle of love. This flame represents the incredible love that God pours into our lives and calls us to share with others. Just as this light brightens the room, may the love of Christ illumine our hearts and guide our actions. We know that God's love is not limited to the faithful. It reaches out in our unfaithfulness and calls us to experience his forgiveness and grace. Through Christ, we find forgiveness, restoration, and a love that never gives up. Love at its core. Love is at the core of the Christmas story. It's the reason why God sent his son Jesus into the world. 
The Apostle John beautifully captures this truth in 1 John chapter 4, where he writes, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. The birth of Jesus is the ultimate expression of God's love. In the midst of our brokenness, God reached out to us sending his son as a beacon of love and redemption. In Jesus, we see the perfect expression of love. His life, teachings, and ultimate sacrifice on the cross demonstrate the depth of God's love for us. Through Jesus, we are invited into a relationship with God. And it's through Jesus that we experience the depth of God's love, the love that knows no bounds and extends to us all, the faithful, the unfaithful, the whole, and the brokenhearted. As we journey through Advent, let's remember that love is so much more than just a feeling. We are vessels of God's love, reaching out to the lost, the broken, and the hurting, just as his love reached out to us. Holy God, thank you for my day. gift for a love displayed <coughs> through Jesus for us with your love so that we may overflow with it to others. Help us embrace your command, command. command to love and not one another as you have loved the decision. Us. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. amen.
invite you to rise to your feet if you're able. We're going to join with all the earth. We're going to fill our lungs and then pour them out in praise to God. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you. says we are your people and you are our God so this church stands in gratitude and gratefulness for the beauty that is your love the love that came to live with us there's nothing more beautiful than that and this church said amen you may be seated and without further ado I invite you to please welcome to the stage the main attraction. Thank you for inviting me to your reunion. <laughs> After 45 years, this will be my final Sunday. Why did we stay so long? Uh, it's simple. People in love do not leave a fulfilling marriage. 
they stay and reinvest. Uh, we've been in love with you all, collectively, uh, and we've had the privilege of connecting profoundly with individuals and households in this time. If you want a more tangible answer to why we've stayed here this long, look around you today and look at the company that one enjoys in this congregation. This morning, we will ponder five human experiences which can be transformative. Each can awaken our hearts or can enlighten our minds. I say can because transcendent effects are not inevitable. They can happen if we're teachable, hungry, open to the fresh work of the Spirit, and pay attention to what God is currently doing in our lives. They can if we process these experiences thoughtfully and apply them in practical life. They can open our spirits to the presence of God and to the value of our human companions. We will consider together privilege, wonder, courage, motivation, and perspective. I picked those out of hundreds of candidates, no doubt. <laughs> but I picked these because they each reveal a context of our deep affection for you. They are uh, expressions of gratitude, and they, are, they also include affirmations. Because life goes forward, and we all hope to be better and more useful next year than we are this year. So clearly, these will be briefly treated. Uh, five is a good enough number. Each can change a mind. Each of these experiences can expand a heart. And each one, like all substantive human experiences, is an art studio for the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the human mind is referred to as the devil's workshop. I want to propose a competing image. Every experience can be an art studio in which the Holy Spirit creates beauty. Ordinary life begins often with magical moments. When we came here, I was 30 and Dale was 19. <laughs> yes. It's plausible. She was 16 when I met her. She was in a group that rented a uh, private pool club where I was a lifeguard. Lifeguards, as you know, are taught to be observant. <laughs> I was in the elevated tower when she smoothly glided by. And my first thought was, nice. Nice swim cap. <laughs> My second thought was, I'm too young to be married. But the thought occurs to me. So we waited and were married three years later. What ought to be interesting for you is that, all t that except for 10 years of our 55-year marriage, we've lived with you. It's been good for us. You have been good for us. And you've nourished us separately and together. Which brings us to the topic of privilege. I have a thesis for each of these experiences, and the thesis for this one is, a deep sense of privilege can draw you to God. It's also true that deeply troubling Difficulties can also draw you to God. But sometimes I think we fall asleep in, in our good fortune. My life has been one in which I have progressively come to understand what God gives. 
and what God even gives in the present moment if we're open to it. You may remember that I came to faith outside the church uh, through a reading of scripture after studying other faiths and through uh, praying honestly about what I read. Three passages connected with me with respect to the privilege in my life. First is James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who, who does not change like shifting shadows. I began to see God as the giver behind so much good, often subtle good. And it, uh, it increased my expectation for new opportunities and for new meanings. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I was arrested by this concept that our creator, though transcendent, might be eminent and available and engaged in individual human stories. As the resident tutor, as the quiet, still voice that needs to be heard. And I began to think, what is his power doing, present and at work for what purpose? And if this is a privilege that God gives to every open heart, how is this experienced in the lands where there are famines and tyrants and unchecked illness? And how is this experience in circumstances of balmy privilege? And it led me to reflect on the conditions of lives about me. It also made me immensely grateful. So I began to pray to this barely known God, whatever mischief you are up to, within me, have your way. Show me something new to be and to do. And I began to see life as a theological experiment. Uh, and it seemed to me that this was offered to anyone who was curious. Luke 12, 48. From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be expected. Privilege, a gift from God in all its forms, leading to an internal transformation of one's unchangeable personality. And yet, with that gift comes the responsibility I was often observant of friends who found school more difficult or friendships more difficult. And it was an early pleasure to help friends like themselves more. There were some mental health issues uh, in our family. And they gave me a sense of my privilege uh, to be enlightened by it, to be spared from it, uh, because sometimes privilege is uh, more complex than we imagine. Privilege is found in what you see. It's a privilege to see things that others don't. Although the gift of discernment is a special form of loneliness. Privilege is found in what you experience if you're paying attention and sorting with objectivity. It is found in what you have, and more importantly, who you have. 
The privilege of good company is a life treasure. But we also find privilege in what we survive and what we're spared. My overexposure to uh, private life difficulties has made me realize that there are some levels of character and quality that are only polished in terrible times. Remarkable hardship can bring remarkable maturity of nature and perception and tenderness. It's important that we not take our, our privilege for, for granted. Uh, I, uh, we, most of us, I think, grew up in America. How often do we think about what a privilege that is? I didn't know that Santa Barbara, as a coastal town with several good beaches, wasn't normative. <laughs> I always lived in a house my father built. I knew that wasn't normative, especially since we moved into them when they were half done. <laughs> I knew my friends were the best of treasures since I was a boy. Treasures especially the ones that improve us. Health, meaningful work. May I say to you today, take some time and count your blessings because if you hold them and let them press in on you, they may draw you closer to God as the giver of every good and perfect gift. I know I have water and you don't. <laughs> Such is privilege. <clears throat> uh, since this is uh, the close of my employment, I want to tell you direct, directly the three best uh, benefits of working here. The first one is the people. Hands down, no question. It's the quality of individuals and the uniqueness of them and the mutual respect between them. Uh, it's, it's really sometimes hard to believe. Wealth and uh, limitation sit by side in pews. High levels of achievement and fairly quiet vocations, worship side by side. Men and women have been elders together in this church since before me, which is like older than dirt. <laughs> and the second, second perk, I think, of working here is the culture. This is a rare environment with people who have deeply felt convictions that can differ from other members, and yet that is not an impediment in friendship, in shared ministry, certainly in worship together. But it's rarer than you might think, or maybe now all of us are beginning to know, because polarity creates um, an isolation of people with their own kind. Now, the third one might surprise you. It's the church's sabbatical policy. <laughs> if that sounds self-interested, the other ones were also. The sabbatical policy has allowed uh, me a, a stunning joy that many other clergy don't have. I have a love of learning. I. I could get lost in telling you how much, but it's one of the uh, greatest pleasures of my life is to freely explore an idea or uh, an event uh, or a person uh, until I'm satisfied with the new understanding. Because of this church, I've had postgraduate experiences abroad three times. 
Um, I describe them, but you'd think I was bragging. They are a privilege. It's a privilege to be a pastor in a church that encourages your continuing education. But let me get to part of my litany. In each case, I want to affirm something about you and then thank you for something in particular. So with respect to privilege, it has been a privilege to serve people like you. You are humble about your abilities, own responsibility for what is entrusted, love friends and strangers, are eager to share gifts and resources. Besides that, you're fun and interesting. <laughs> Countless clergy would cherish this kind of congregation, truly. I've described you as a culture uh, during graduate work and during travels and other clergy thought that I was new here and on a mental honeymoon. But it's, it's been that good to be in your company. So I want to thank you today for your friendships, not only with me, but with my family. Not only with us, but with each other. Because your respectful engagement with each other is the connective tissue within this body of Christ. And I think it's the Holy Spirit that sustains that openness and regard. Now, before leaving this topic, I must mention one other formative privilege. Many of you have enjoyed it also. For most people, parents are their first working God concept, the ones with the power and the authority, the ones who provide. And so often people's initial impressions of God begin with their composite impression of their parents. God must be like the little gods who've ruled my house. My parents gave me my first, my parents gave my first impression of God a running head start. Um, so trustworthy, uh, so genuine that it uh, it made religion seem healthy, transparent, and open. Uh, my earthly father made a heavenly father a compelling, imaginable being. Now philosophy, theology, scripture, life experience, and prayer finished the job. But it was, it was a healthy beginning. Let's move beyond that sense of privilege to a sense of wonder. Uh, here's my thesis. Conscious beliefs nurture a sense of wonder. Now, there are a lot of casual beliefs that are barely conscious. It's like saying the flag salute in third grade. Not much of a sense of civic scope. But when beliefs are genuinely believed, they create a sense of wonder. Mine were progressive coming to faith outside the church. And so for me, as I read scripture, as it gathered self-authenticating authority, I began to believe it more earnestly, which made me uh, pause when something was puzzling and made me pause when something was clearly improving. Romans 12, one to three. I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, on the basis of God's mercy. Interesting. On the basis of God's mercy, I appeal to you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, not sacrifice that included a death and extinction, but a sacrifice that was lived out over decades. For whom, to whom, I asked? To our maker. And it continues here. 
as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. You ever heard that phrase, a reasonable act of worship? So I, uh, I can't speed read through scripture if I'm in a state of mind that wants it to equip and empower me. We need to slow down, I think, to notice even the wonder of a garden or, or a hummingbird or a butterfly. Well, scripture needs a pause as well. But this passage continues. It's only three verses, but it's full of so much. Verse two, do not be conformed to this age. Which age? Isn't this a relevant word for any time in history? Do not be conformed to this age, to the forces that would reshape you in the likeness of others. It's very unhealthy for churches to have disdain for their host culture, to look down on people who lack their faith and to uh, discredit the insights of secular souls. It's really unhealthy. It must displease our maker. But still, if we're living a life under the influence of the Spirit, uh, we do not want to be conformed mindlessly to the age in which we live, but rather to be transformed by the renewal of the mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now there is a, uh, a redirection for how we think about our own maturing. And for, for me, as I grew in faith, these things would cause me to question, what does that look like in action? What can we do to accelerate it? Uh, now I have something for you. Think about this. When our minds are renewed by the Spirit, our imagination is transformed. Our eyes see wonders within reach, and we explore them with deeds. I have something more abstract for you in a moment, just briefly. My favorite uh, Jewish theologian is Abraham Joshua Heschel. He's written many books uh, with very fresh perspective on how God engages with humanity. Uh, there's an anthology that, was, that he titled, I Asked for Wonder. Now, when we live life, there are things we ask for that we aspire to grow in. I, I had to when I was an adolescent, and having that sense of direction has served me well. But let me share something with you from Heschel. Wonder, rather than doubt, is the root of knowledge. Doubt comes in the wake of knowledge as a state of vacillation between two contrary or contradictory views as a state in which a belief we had embraced begins to totter. Does that sound obscure? Tell me yes. 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 Okay, so um, Rasa Akeda, uh, a joyful colleague while he was on our senior staff, um, wrote a piece f to guide my life when this congregation celebrated my getting my doctorate from Princeton. He wrote, The Oath of the Curator, uh, setting before me things to aspire to that might make me more useful. <laughs> the opening paragraph reads, I swear by the wise Father, the sovereign Son, and the efficacious Holy Spirit, and by love and grace, and by all the care deacons, that according to my ability and judgment, I will keep this oath and stipulation. Now, there are several lovely paragraphs, uh, but the one I think you might enjoy most reads this way. I will pose no indecipherable conundrum <laughs> leading to consternation or ambiguity to any, though it be expected of me, nor will I be insensitive to the perplexities evidenced on the visage of those who endeavor to process 
to a point of understanding. <laughs> the profundities induced by sophisticated rhetoric. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's nice to be known. Yeah. Now, as penance for the conundrums I've visited upon your head through the decades, uh, I've ag agreed to translate a few favorite sermons into manuscript in the next year and make them available for any who want them. Um, if you want to be on that list, see Peggy. Here's my affirmation of you with respect to sharing a sense of wonder. It has been a joy to dialogue with you about your theological discoveries. Sadly, many churches have a party line position on nearly everything. Yet the deepest mysteries of faith are a struggle to understand. I'm glad we give each other intellectual freedom to explore faith, to wrestle with mysteries. Your curiosity about God's true nature is wonderful. Your transparency is refreshing. Thank you. And may I add, uh, thank you for blessing me with a specialty role as pastor of care and counseling, allowing me to do what I do best within a loving faith family. Did you hear that one? It is a very rare assignment that I've enjoyed in this specialty. And it would not have happened without senior pastor leadership and elder leadership and uh, member support. Uh, so you're responsible for my joy. It's been a wonder also to watch you live your lives. Which brings us to courage. Here's my thesis. Faith, hope, and love each inspire courage. These theological virtues as standalones or in partnership inspire levels of courage that would not happen without one of them bursting into maturity. And they do because God's spirit is the best company in the worst times. Here's a scripture meant for every one of us, 2 Corinthians 1, three through four. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation. Isn't that a strong image? the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who consoles us in our affliction so that we may be able to console those who are in any affliction with the consolation with which we ourselves are consoled by God. Suffering with a redemptive purpose. I think I see Keith Fraker here. Once he was speaking and he said, uh, he quoted a aphorism, a travel makes you broad, suffering makes you deep. I'd rather travel. <laughs> and yet we are not exempt, we believers, from the hardships of humanity. And when we learn a lesson about self-care, or comfort, we are to be providing it to others. Yes, we have very different life experiences, even sorrows parachute into our lives differently at different ages with different effects. But they all teach us our powerlessness and the necessity that we mature into tender hearts. Here's my affirmation for you. Many of you have practiced integrity and courage in difficult circumstances. I think of this as private life heroism. There are many who suffer in silence. 
because their lot in life requires endurance. And so they um, surrender to the necessity and with God's help, grow through it. I have decades of memories that recall your choices, deeds, and attitudes. Uh, I'll tell you one story. There's a couple that came to church. I met them when they came to our uh, courtyard worship. And I was immediately struck after talking with them. My, they are both exceptional human beings. Uh, they are paying attention to the world around them and they are quick to introduce themselves to complete strangers. And I just was struck by the quality of the two of them. And I thought to myself, they deserve each other. And their children are fortunate. Within two years, the father was killed during uh, a hazard, hazardous hobby. And the wife was left with young children to raise on her own. She found it very difficult. She worked several jobs to keep the house and to provide. And then when she got her feet under her, which she surely did at the end of long endurance, she decided to make a gift to the sustenance fund, which it's been my pleasure to manage, three years in a row. A substantial gift dedicated to women in need who are surprised by catastrophe. So I got to deliver her, her lesson and generosity. There are so many uh, lives that have been loved well through the sustenance fund. Uh, by definition, it's confidential. Uh, and, uh, and for me, it's been, it's been humbling to be a front row witness to what people do with the lessons of their own courage, living through their own difficulty. I want to thank you for trusting me with your unedited stories. It has been especially gratifying when you have trusted someone you love to my care. You've honored me. One of my highest values is I, I want to be useful. Now, I know that that's not always healthy, and it has excesses, but you've given me the pleasure of being more useful. I was once asked at a staff, well, we were all asked at a staff Christmas party, if you weren't in your present role, what would you like to be? And I said, a philanthropist. Well, there are perks to being a philanthropist. But uh, in a quiet, modest way, doing the sustenance fund has given me that, that pleasure. Now, let me say before we move on, if others heard your stories, they'd be nourished by them, even inspired. It would motivate some of their own investments in life to know what you faced and how you navigated your future. So share more freely, more often, that there may be more beneficiaries. Now we come to motivation. Here's the thesis. Knowing your spiritual gifts will encourage you to invest in others. Think about that. Knowing the ways that God has endowed you or the fortunate circumstances in which you find yourself, if you really understand those, it will encourage you to invest in others. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same Lord, the same God, 
who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That's one of my favorite verses in Scripture. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And I also encourage you to think about the fact that it's God that activates these gifts as if they're dormant until uh, the catalyst of the Spirit's influence is applied. Speaking of motivation, I'm, in, I'm motivated to move more quickly. <laughs> so here's my affirmation for you under the topic of motivation. We have a rich history of volunteer service. I mean, a rich history, uncommonly good for a church of our size. And we have in that history many bold initiatives. Most of our creative compassion projects have been conceived and executed by members. This is how it should be. They've come primarily from yourselves and your peers. Examples are certainly the Cairo Orphanage in Romania, Nancy Lane, San Jose Family Shelter, Robin Hood Ministry, the Albanian Health Fund, Medical Mercy Flights, Sunrise Orphanage, Points of Light. I could go on. That's just the tip of the iceberg. And what's fascinating is this came from your hearts and minds. Yes, staff support it, and, uh, but, it, but it's one of the signs of greatest health in this church that um, you don't wait to do God's work when you see that it is needed. So my, my thank you is, thank you for what you have modeled, for listening to the Spirit, seeing unmet needs, and for committing yourselves to causes larger than yourself. This happens because if we live a life under the Spirit's influence, God amplifies our best qualities and subdues our worst ones. That's why this happens. Closing with the last uh, experience, perspective. We who are older than others here know that age improves your vision. You may need cataract surgery and, and bifold or trifold glasses, but what you see is much more crystal clear. And your emotions about it are less reactive. It's fun to grow into better discernment. It's fun. Uh, you may need to remind yourself of that from time to time. So my thesis is, if you have clear convictions, they will alter your point of view. If you have casual convictions that have minimal true influence on the way life is lived, it's not gonna improve your discernment. But if you have clear convictions, your point of view will improve, probably about everyone and everything. What do I want to affirm on this topic? It would be pure neglect if I did not honor those who have gone before us. They lived the formative concepts and precepts of our church culture. We inherited it. During my tenure alone, more than a thousand members have died. Think about that. I know for some of you, it's a parent or a spouse or a child or a best friend. Irreplaceable people. But as we think about God's work here, let's remember that in the last 45 years, over a thousand of our members have gone to their maker. I sometimes asked myself, who, who do I miss? Oh, it's a long list. But many of these people that I miss are dead. 
Uh, so let's love on the living while we have them. And let's sometimes pray prayers of specific gratitude for specific people who are no longer with us. I want to affirm the staff here. Uh, if I was younger, Sean, I'd want to stay just to work alongside you. It's really been a pleasure. And the senior staff, I think, is a very interesting mix of original people who can see the world in color, not black and white. They're astute, they're gifted, they're dedicated, and they're worthy of your trust. They do their best in each of their ministries. And I must say the elders, my goodness, the elders we've had, uh, I'd, I'd say in the last decade, they have embodied your differences. And boy, can they play well with others. It's really remarkable. On some issues, they might be 50-50. And it's not an impasse to their joy of seeking God's direction together. It's really quite wonderful. Those of you that are older, um, don't lament the leadership of the young. This is a very savvy group uh, with the best intentions and the best practices. I need to stop there. I'd like to spend more time on that, but you're, you're already giving me a courtesy that you often have before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, lunch is waiting. Uh, but I wanna thank you for something that we don't thank often enough publicly. Um, I know some of the self-sacrifice that some people have made to support our church materially. I also know that it's a, a myth that's maybe true of other places that those who have the most are not as generous as their circumstances allow, not true here. Uh, there's been very remarkable generosity that's been sustained for a long time. So I want to thank you for your invisible gifts, your prayers for people in pain or need, for the overlooked and under-resourced in the world. And I want to thank you for your donations to this church, to our missions, and other worthy causes. Um, your generosity really has been quite wonderful. And I know that my livelihood has come from your generosity. I know that. I've lived in that awareness, and I'm, I'm grateful for my part. Um, it's humbling but it's healthy. And now, to land this airplane, <laughs> may I say before I, I pray a prayer that's in scripture and is one of my favorites, may I say that Dale and I and our family are in debt to your love. Serving you has filled our lives with joy and meaning. Now I will pray a prayer and invite you to close your eyes if you're comfortable with that. And uh, may it be our prayer for the future and the present life of this church. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen.
Thanks, Arvin. Well, we want to spend a few minutes just uh, affirming you, Arvin, and uh, I know you're going to get a lot of that out there, and that's awesome. That's the way it should be. And so uh, we're going to start with Morgan here. You all already met Morgan, and so uh, why don't you kick it off, and then we'll go to Laurel after that. Sure. So, uh, Arvin, I have uh, three minutes to sum up the appreciation that this congregation has for you. Um, <laughs> Although I'll note that your sermon is supposed to be 25 minutes, so if I go a little over, then fair is fair. First time. <laughs> I also know that if I start crying, it's going to eat into my three minutes, so no eye contact for the next three minutes, please, Arvin. First, I want to say congratulations. Congratulations on a remarkable career. Congratulations on a retirement well done. I guess that, um, you know, after 40 plus years, we can't complain that you didn't put in your time with us. <laughs> and so on behalf of this entire congregation, and in fact, on behalf of many congregations, Arvin, past and present, thank you. As I look at you, I uh, remember you dedicating my children, as many people in this room have. I remember you burying loved ones of dear friends of mine, as many people in this room remember. I remember some of the thousands of weddings that you've officiated from this very stage, Arvin. You have helped us through our grief, you have presided over our joy, and you have inspired our new beginnings. So we thank you for that. We will miss your voice, Arvin. We will miss your intelligent, wise, and caring voice. Someone um, just this last week in jest said, well, the silver lining to Arvin leaving is that now we're actually going to have to listen to God's voice for a change. <laughs> for so many people, it's not a stretch to imagine that God is good, caring, and patiently understanding with us after time spent with you, Arvin. Mm. And it's not a stretch to believe that Jesus Christ loves us personally, not just corporately as he does, but that he knows, values, and loves each of us because we've felt that from you these past years, Harvin. You'll hear these words one day from a higher authority, but today this congregation says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Hmm. Thank you. you have truly served us well, and you have served your God well among us, Arvin, and we are thankful for that. And now may the knowledge of how many people you have directed toward a better understanding of the Almighty God and a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ, his Son, give you humble satisfaction until you hear those words again. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Arvin, this church loves you. And this church thanks God for you. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Laurel, would you share? I'm going to have to read. I can't remember everything. There's so many things I want to say to you, Dale. This is for you, from all of us. Now, I want to begin, before I begin our gratitude list, I want to go on a personal note. I just want you to know how glad I was that, you, that when Arvin came, he brought three redheads with him, because then I wasn't the only one here. That was wonderful. Ever since that day, 
we have all been blessed by your ready smile, your welcoming spirit, and your warm, straightforward presence. And we have loved your hugs that greeted us at so many services and other events. Our life together is just better because you have been with us. For the next few minutes, I will, uh, it will be my pleasure to offer you a mini version of This Is Your Life, Dale Engelson. <laughs> First and foremost, we want to remember your primary roles as wife and mother of Corey, Jessica, and Gretchen. As some of us may know, you cared for your family in many creative and patient ways. And your extended family found hospitality in your home when you and Arvin were raising your young family and while all kinds of remodeling was going on. <laughs> Service seems to be deep in your bones. Your ministries among our church family are so meaningful to us, Dale. For 37 years, your guitar music and singing brought joy to our children in the Sunday school. For 20 years, your planning, spiritual guidance, and good humor richly blessed our women's retreats. When you led our communion services, we seemed to draw closer to Jesus. For 10 years, you worked with the Federated Local Outreach Team to fund and encourage local ministries. You blessed our younger households when you planned family camps. For 15 years, you modeled for all of us meaningful ways that we could reach out to those in need. Rita Olson, Esther Schmidt, and you inspired our congregation to support over 200 people so that after they left the San Jose Family Shelter, they would not lapse into homelessness again. Along with this ministry, this team started and managed our first giving tree. Dale, your heart for service also extended even further to our community. For 14 years, you had a child care business in your home called Nanny's Place, where you offered below rate for school teachers and single moms. After you closed your business, you stepped into a new 20-year career when you worked for the Saratoga Union School District, serving the elementary school children at Foothill School. I'm almost finished. <laughs> I won't get everything, but I'm gotten them. Since you retired three years ago, your life of service has not seemed to diminish one bit. Grandma activities and providing an occasional haven for the family and support for others keep you creatively engaged. Dale, I've been touched, I've only touched on the highlights of your 45 years of your life with us. As you offered your comfort, encouragement, practical help, and good humor to us, we know we have been blessed because you were genuinely and lovingly with us. Thank you. On, on behalf of the Saratoga Federated Church family, it gives me great pleasure to extend our gratitude you, to you with a little gift, membership in the Fine Arts Museums in San Francisco. And dear Dale, may you feast your senses and curious mind with our appreciation.
Awesome stuff. Um, I, I'll be really short, very brief. Um, Dale, I know somebody that knows what it's like to be married to somebody in pastoral ministry, so thank you. Yeah, it's a big deal. Um, it's not easy. And uh, Arvin, I just want to share three words with you, and you already used one of them. Uh, you know I call, I call you the Yoda of our staff, of our church. And the first word is wisdom. Uh, I'm going to miss our Tuesday coffee meetings. And I think we talked more about other stuff than church stuff a lot of times. We love to go off on tangents theologically or philosophically. Um, but you shared your heart with me during those meetings over the last four years. And it's such a privilege for me that I got to spend these last four years with you. And I wish you were younger because the church needs people like you big time. Um, so thanks. Thanks for your wisdom. The, the second word is perspective. I can't tell you how many times we've been in a meeting, whether it's the council of elders, the senior staff, the whole staff, or some team, um, where you slowed everybody down. And you know how I often say that Holly says, say it like Arvin would say it. <laughs> um, you slow us down and you have so much history, but you have so much depth and you've given us so much perspective where I can look around the table and see people going, oh, and we're going to miss that big time. And the last word is acceptance. The very first time I met you, uh, I don't think we met during the whole interview process that I went through. Uh, and I think it was like my first day on the job. And you walked into Fireside Room. And I saw you for the first time, and I was going to shake your hand, and you wouldn't have any of that. You just enveloped me and gave me this huge hug without even really knowing me. But I've seen you do that with people for the last four years. You've accepted people that disagree with you sharply about a lot of things in life, and there's love there, and that acceptance is driven by love. I've seen you accept people that are bruised and battered and broken and help them put their lives back together. I've seen you accept people that are offensive and awkward. I've seen you accept all sorts of people. And I think if the Holy Spirit was incarnate, he would be like you. And so thanks. Thanks for being my mentor uh, over these last four years and investing in me. It's such a privilege. And you all have a chance to write blessings to Arvin. So if you didn't get one of these blessing cards, there's baskets around the church right out here in the narthex and other places. Grab one. Don't let this time go by without writing something to Arvin and Dale, okay? And now we're going to pray over you, bro. Is that okay? All right. God, thanks so much for this amazing couple and what you've done in them and through them, the remarkable journey that they've been on. And we know that that journey is not over, but it's coming to a conclusion here at Saratoga Federated Church. And so we thank you from the bottom of our hearts because we know that indeed every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of Lights, and you gave us Arvin and Dale and their family as a gift for the last 45 years, and we're so grateful. We are better because of them. We pray that you would give them health in this next chapter of their journey, that you would give them energy, that they would be able to soak in the beauty of life in all of its creativity and mystery and joy. Give them just incredible time together and we will, we will be excited to hear the echoes of how they're doing. We thank you and we praise you this day in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, bro. Hey, let's stand. And um, one, one other thing is that uh, we're going to let them leave. So, you know, like at a wedding, you let the couple leave. 
You can't tackle them and keep them here. They're, they're going to be at a table. We want most of you to go to Richard's Hall. That's where there's a lot of tables. There's food in the library. And if you don't know what that means, just start walking that way and you'll figure it out, okay? I do want to say it's important that you guys know Arvin picked all these songs this morning. And you might notice that some of the pronouns in these songs got changed from I to we. And so as we sing this song, I Will Follow, you'll notice that it shifts to us as a congregation, as a family, and as friends of this wonderful family, claiming that we will follow. So if you would, lift your voice one more time with us as we close out the morning. We're going to sing like this. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I move. I will follow you Who you love, I love How you serve, I serve If this life I live I will follow you bless you church family go ahead and make your way on out fill out one of those blessing cards and join us over food to celebrate the work and wonder of who arvin has been here amen, amen. god bless you as you go